All right, well, what about the second passage we're going to look at in this message? What about work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Here we are in Philippians chapter 2, and Paul says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, you can see how people would take this passage out of context, take a little phrase, fear and trembling, and then say, see, you're supposed to be scared of God. And in fact, your salvation is in jeopardy. And if you don't keep working for your salvation, and if you don't keep being fearful that you're going to maybe lose your salvation, so you work harder to keep it, then you're not listening to Philippians chapter 2. Because it says, work for your salvation and be scared the whole time. Well, is that what it says? No, it doesn't say work for your salvation, of course. It says work out your salvation. So the idea of working out your salvation is very different from working for your salvation. I mean, you know that we as believers, we don't buy the idea that we're working for our salvation. When would you arrive? When would you get there? When is enough enough? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You would never do it. And so he's not talking about working for your salvation. He's talking about a salvation that we've already got. He says, my beloved, he's talking to believers. Believers have this salvation in, so what's the next step? Let it come out. It's in, so let it ooze out of you in expressions of Jesus Christ. Work out what God has already worked in. Now, why does he say with fear and trembling? Well, think about it. We're the only ones. We're the only ones on the planet who have the life of God himself residing inside of us. I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of a big deal, right? Work out because God is at work in, so you can go, whoa. I mean, are you serious? The God of the universe lives inside of me? He didn't just create things and relate to us from the outside. He infused me with his life. He's at work inside of me every day, every moment. So I can work out what God has worked in. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. And so this expression, fear and trembling, can mean reverence and awe, deep respect, going whoa and wow. So when you see this passage, go ahead. Go ahead and give it a whoa. Go ahead and give it a wow, because that's what Paul is saying. Whoa, wow, the God of the universe actually lives inside of me, and I get to be an expression of him. Now, you'll notice what he's doing. I just want to draw your attention to the last part, to Philippians 2.13 here. It says, he's at work in you to do what? Well, first, to will and then to do or work of his good pleasure. So he doesn't say, get to work. He says, I'm working in you to want. That's what will means. He's working in you to will. He's working in you to want, to desire. So he doesn't say, get to work, get busy. No, he says, I'm causing you to want what I want and to do what I do. You see that? We're on the same team. He's working in us so that we are in agreement with him in each moment. You say, well, I'm not in agreement with him in each moment. I mean, you know, sometimes I think the wrong thing. That's an attitude. Where's that from? From the renewing of the mind. But sometimes I I choose, where's that coming from? You're taking in a thought that is not a renewed thought. It still doesn't indicate anything about your heart. What we have seen time and time again is that God has cleaned house, moved in, the heart is new. He's working in the heart so that we want what He wants and we want to do what He wants us to do. See, under the old covenant, it was do what I say no matter what you want. That's the law. Do what I say no matter what you want. And then 
What did Paul discover? Miserable man that I am under the law. Who's going to free me from this? I keep coveting and coveting and coveting. I try so hard as a devout Jew to do it, and yet I can't do it. Why? Because you don't really want it. That's why. And so when he takes out your heart of stone and gives you the new obedient heart, then he's not saying fake it and be somebody else and be churchy and try to be Christian and try to get the fruits. No, he's saying, I have infused your life with the fruit of my spirit because I have injected you with my spirit and I'm causing you to desire and crave what I crave. So, fear and trembling. I mean, how should we look at it? Well, interestingly, Paul uses it somewhere else. Not just in the first passage, but here we see the same expression in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Check it out. The Apostle Paul says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now, there's something common between these two uses of the expression fear and trembling. Why were we supposed to have fear and trembling in the first passage? Because, whoa and wow, it is God at work. Now, why was Paul in fear and trembling among the Corinthians? Because, whoa and wow, it is the power of God, not the wisdom of men. Do you see that? You see the parallel? In the first passage, Paul is saying, work out because God is working in and it's God. It's the creator of all, the designer of the universe. This is serious business. So work out what he has worked in with a big woe and a big wow. And then here, the same thing. Paul is saying, I was doing it. I was with you. I was hanging out with you, Corinthians. And I had a message on my heart. But the whole time, I was not chill. I was not relaxed. Dude. This was legit. I was among you, and the Spirit of God Himself was testifying in me and through me with such power that I had to to let out a big woe and a big wow. That's what he's saying here. So is this being scared of our Heavenly Father? Far from it. In fact, it's the opposite. That He would qualify us to house the divine. Think about what God thinks of you. When he has qualified you to house the divine. He's invited you to the table. He says, you get to be on the team. You remember in school when they were picking teams at recess. I mean, you wanted to make sure you were picked. And you sure hoped you were on a good team so you might win. Well, see, we, we, get, to, we get to be invited to the best team. We're on God's side. What does he think of us? I had a friend we were talking, a a guy friend of mine, and we were talking about our friendship and how awesome it was that we get to hang out and talk Jesus, and he's a pastor and I'm a pastor. And at one point, he said this. He said, you know, I not only love you as a friend, but I, I like you, and I want you to know that, that I like you. And I'll tell you what, that did something for me, to not just be loved, because that could be generic. I mean, for God so loved the world, do you see it? For God so loved the world. Okay, he loves everybody. But my friend, he said, I like you. And then he started to list off reasons that he liked me. You know, that's what God is doing. He's saying, I like you. I invest in you. I'm with you 24-7. I've qualified you. I want you on my team. You're involved. You're in the midst of it. I think your personality is great. I think you are great. I have qualified you and included you and made you one with me. I could run this show. I mean, God, God might say, I could run this show. I was running it for millions of years. But why did I create you? And why did I invite you to salvation? And why did I save you and indwell you and include you and qualify you? I did it to show you it's about relationship. And I don't just love you. I like you. I'm for you. I think the world of you. That's the gospel message. God demonstrated his like in this. 
that Christ dwells in us 24-7 without interruption. We are friends of God. 